Hey. Why? Why? You see, that's your problem, Jimmy. Thinking the ends justify the means. What Colonel Sanders is to chicken, Saul Goodman is to the law. Oh. Kim, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I think the word you're looking for is audacious. Hi, everyone. In the wake of the conclusion of the best show on television, I think we're all a little more lost and adrift. But that's not a bad thing. It can cause us to reflect. What did it all mean? Could any of it have been avoided? Would Lalo have made a good YouTuber? In part one of this channel's exploration of Better Call Saul, we talked about how the show treats the question of whether Jimmy can change. And as soon as the series finale ended, I got comment after comment on that first video from people stating that we had actually finally gotten an answer. I mean, he incriminates himself in court, turning his seven-year plea deal into an 86-year sentence, and he does it just for the sake of his conscience and the respect of Kim. He takes responsibility for his significant role in the crimes of Walter White. He even admits to manipulating Chuck's liability insurance carrier to raise their rates, and he acknowledges how this caused a chain of events that ended in his brother's premature death. Watching Jimmy finally be honest against his own practical self-interest, it would seem that this willful embrace of accountability represents a moral triumph and a redemption of his character. Or, let me ask, is it a redemption or just a demption, I guess? Like, where does the re come from when we've never seen him take accountability in this way before? Certainly not for these specific behaviors, at least. Is he getting back to how good he was before? For or reaching a new height. Does it matter? I started thinking hard about whether we've seen him take accountability in a serious way like this at all before. I mean, we've seen him apologize, but when he seems sorry, it's usually because he's trying to get something, not to take unselfish accountability. This is such a central aspect of Jimmy that we see a great example of it in just the third episode of the show, which opens with a flashback to Chuck hesitating on whether to help Jimmy get out of jail after the whole Chicago sunroof incident. Jimmy performs regret and willingness to change, and it's enough for the moment to achieve what he wants. Another example is when he apologizes to Kim after their first enormous fraud together on the Huel Babinaw case, but it's mostly because he thinks she's upset and he wants to make sure they're still on good terms. He's obviously not actually sorry for what they did, because the moment Kim reveals she wants to do another scam, he gets on board, helping her commit serious fraud at her job. These are apologies he doles out to minimize the negative consequences of his actions, but in the grand finale courtroom scene, of course, he's not apologizing per se, but he's taking accountability, and it's not to minimize his consequences. What he does actually maximizes his consequences, really, though I don't think that he was trying to do that exactly. I think he just was not prioritizing himself. Or that's not right, actually, since he was doing it to be able to look himself in the mirror, as well as to show Kim he's still a person. So he was prioritizing a healthy part of himself for once instead of the overwhelming other part that was so used to being prioritized, the ignoring and minimizing consequences part. The last words of his sworn-in speech are, I don't live with that. Sounds like accountability to me. Let's keep looking into whether he's done something like this before. There was that season 5 finale where Lalo finally leaves their apartment and Jimmy admits to Kim what he did in the desert. One guy got away. Later I helped him say, get that one too. Kim gives him a hug, of course, because the emphasis is not on Jimmy admitting to helping Mike kill someone. The vast majority of what he's sharing is about himself being victimized when he was attacked. This is something other than accountability because he's describing the traumatic levels of stress he endured and can barely stop himself from sharing it, which is obviously very different from the highly intentional speech he gives in court in the series' grand finale. To look closer at this episode, when he and Kim get to the hotel, he goes further to attempt to take accountability, this time for something much more within his control. Am I bad for you? She considers it, but has faith that he can avoid danger like that in the future. Plus, we see soon that Kim is more than ready to put aside such moral concerns as they hatch the Howard scam at the hotel. In the dramatic and beautiful conclusion scene of their relationship, of course, Kim has gained a lot of perspective on this. 
We are bad for each other. When she says that, I was like, oh, of course. Why didn't I think of that? It seems so obvious. There's much more to say about this scene, but for the moment, let's just say that season five's finale had Jimmy inching closer to a truer perspective on the consequences of his actions. The fact that it was the season five finale that he had these confessional moments with Kim made me want to see if the show had some interesting finale pattern where Jimmy tries to be honest about things he's done and makes big confessions in the season finales. So before we get on to some other stuff, let's get going today with a accountability-centered finale roundup. Woohoo, yeah, accountability-centered finale roundup, yeah. The first season finale is the famous Marco episode, the episode where Jimmy goes back to his hometown of Cicero, Illinois to hang out and run scams with his old buddy Marco. As this is an episode of Jimmy briefly escaping from his life in Albuquerque, keep in mind that what came right before was Chuck's famous I know what you are, you're slippin' Jimmy diatribe. Jimmy immediately stops helping support Chuck after a year and a half, gives his big sandpiper client to HHM, and accepts that his brother is stifling his career. Instead of working at HHM, Jimmy is leading the seniors' bingo game. At first, the biggest admission moment in this episode seems to be when he admits to them the intimate details of his Chicago sunroofing escapades. It's hard to consider this as him taking accountability since it was entirely inappropriately done. Men will literally ruin bingo instead of going to therapy. Then we see him go back to Cicero, hang out with Marco, and eventually when it's time to go, he struggles to break the news to his friend. And I appreciate your hospitality, but a week's gonna have to do it. I gotta go home. Marco doesn't accept this and is pretty manipulative. Y you hate it out there. What do you gotta go back to? My clients. Because Jimmy is painted into a corner by his friend, he brings out the big guns, truth. <sighs> I'm a lawyer. What? It's just interesting to me how they had been hanging out for a full week and Jimmy hadn't mentioned that he was a lawyer. He only mentions it when it's useful. This is a good example of his flexible relationship with the truth, which we'll get into more in a bit. As a side note, I also want to mention from the end of this episode an example of Jimmy taking, like, opposite accountability, where instead of talking about how he feels bad about something bad he did, he talks about how he feels bad about something good he did. Well. I know what stopped me. And you know what? It's never stopping me again. It's actually sort of a confusing line to me because he could mean just his conscience generally or his sense of empathy or something, but what stopped him from taking that money was that he wanted to send the Kettlemans back to Kim at HHM to do something nice for her. I know this is a lot to ask, but you have to convince them to come back to HHM. He can't convince the Kettlemans to plead guilty and surrender the money without giving the cash back that they paid him, the 30 grand. When he asks Mike why they didn't keep the full 1.6 million when they found it, it's a first part of what comes in the season 6 grand finale scene between them as Jimmy asks why they don't keep the 7 million dollars they're carrying through the desert. This latter time though, of course, he transitions quickly into the more important subject of time machines, but in this scene that closes season 1, Jimmy is much more focused. Next up, the season 2 finale, which is named Click with a K, which I should have mentioned in the last video when I I talked about the show's heavy featuring of pen clicks. The click in this episode is when Chuck turns off the tape recording he's using to record Jimmy confessing. And so yes, there is a confession in this finale too. I did it for Kim! So we see Jimmy's confession with a catch pattern continuing, since he's only confessing here to try to convince Chuck not to quit HHM. Basically, he's only taking responsibility to minimize the negative consequences of his actions because it was his sabotage that made Chuck feel like he had to quit HHM. Chuck records him to hold him accountable in arguably a too severe way, but Jimmy wasn't willingly being held accountable at all. He was just trying to appease Chuck, so his admission here is no more ethical than any other means to an end behavior. Season 3 continues the confession pattern with Jimmy visiting Chuck after Chuck is bought out of HHM for what would be their last conversation where Chuck is shockingly healthy and Jimmy is vaguely apologetic. If I had to do it all over again, I would maybe do some things differently. The next exchange is very interesting in hindsight. I just thought you should know that. That you have regrets. Yeah, I have regrets. Hmm. 
This serves as a foreshadow of the season 6 finale scene where Walter calls out that Saul's time machine thought experiment is just his weird way of asking to talk about regret. Regrets. Yeah. Back in the season 3 finale scene, Chuck is calling out Jimmy in basically the same way, saying that he doesn't face his regrets head on, he tiptoes around them. Chuck is obviously way too harsh in this scene, and that's not Jimmy's fault, but Jimmy also definitely did not do a serious job of apologizing. He didn't own up to anything specifically or connect any dots about his behavior. Season 4's finale shows us another confession with a catch, this time with Jimmy at the stand appearing to open up to the court and Kim and the lady with the nice smile about how much pressure he's felt being the brother of the famous lawyer Charles McGill. I'll never be as moral as him. I'll never be as smart. I'll never be as respected. It's so interesting how most of the time watching Better Call Saul you can tell when Jimmy's lying, but at certain points it could really go either way, and I don't think I've ever seen anyone say that they called it here on the first time watching and knew he was being phony. I mean on rewatch it's incredibly obvious, but you know, that doesn't mean a lot. This takes us back to the season 5 finale with Jimmy dangling on the edge of taking accountability for having a harmful effect on Kim with his choices. But we talked about that one, so let's free ourselves from this finale fixation and keep looking for whether Jimmy ever really takes accountability before the final episode. When he gets beat up selling phones on the street, he doesn't confess to Kim about his sort of bizarre hustle. Instead, he lies by omission and just says, I got mugged. He's lying about why he was at the hot dog restaurant at 1am, saying he had just parked far away and was walking back to his car. But he's still trying to open up to Kim and get support. He laments that he used to be a lot tougher looking and people wouldn't have messed with him like this. She asks how they would have known not to mess with him back then and Jimmy's clearly challenging himself to give as honest a response as he can. I don't just... Well, because back then, uh... I guess I was one of them. If you transcribe how he started that line, he said, I don't dot dot dot, just dot dot dot, oop. Let's hear that again. I don't just... Well... <sighs> What an interesting series of language-like noises structured around a breath. That's him struggling to be honest, and you can tell it's obviously hard for him to open up about his slip in history. It's hard for him for a lot of reasons, including that Kim responds by shutting it down immediately. Well, those days are over. Jimmy nods and says yeah in a pretty clearly insincere way, because he struggles either to be self-aware or to be honest. Or both. Then again, we see this usually talkative man struggle to find words. Yeah. But, uh... And then after a pause that's so long that it would get this video demonetized if I played it in full, we see this come bubbling out of Jimmy. You know what? Um, I think tomorrow I might, uh, call that shrink. Kim is surprised, which is fair, because in this context, it's a bit out of nowhere, and it seems to clearly imply that Jimmy's aware that their conversation about his previous toughness is touching on something really sensitive. Something he's aware he's struggling to talk about with her. She gave him the therapist's information in the previous episode, and it immediately influenced Jimmy to lie to her that he had just accepted the job he had just rejected. So at first, he saw therapy as a threat, something he could only overcome by manipulating his relationship to the truth. And then, after we see him potentially seem to consider it in this scene with Kim, they have this exchange. Couldn't hurt, right? Couldn't hurt? This reminded me of the scene back when Jimmy was advising Kim to take the Schweikart position after their second scam and sleepover. What's not to love about that? Yeah. What's not to love? This is obviously a normal way that people communicate with each other. We do this all the time when we talk, but it's notable that he didn't repeat what she said, instead saying, yeah, but... Those days are over. Yeah. But, 
The not included subtext after the but is, but it's not going to be so easy for me to stop myself from continuing to seek the toughness I've just described to you as being a big part of my past identity, or something, you know, like that. The scene ends with Kim staring at Jimmy like the thinker statue as he sits staring forward, just being sort of scared at the idea of genuinely using introspection. By the episode's end, we see Jimmy rip up the referral information for the therapist he told Kim he'd call. After running into a distraught Howard who was going twice weekly for grief therapy after Chuck's death. And I want to take a moment here to respond to a comment five or ten people left on the third video in this series when we looked at this scene. I got these comments saying that Jimmy ripped up the referral because he figured if Howard was going to therapy and was distraught like he was then it wasn't helping him. I found these comments strange because while it's possible that that is Jimmy's line of thought in this moment, that's not a rational line of thought, so it's not the end of the explanation. Why did Jimmy think that if he did? Like, if I told you that I don't go to the dentist because my high school bully had braces, I think we can agree that that's not the full explanation. There are some factors being left out of the equation. It would be a mistake to treat too many of Jimmy's decisions as if they are fully rational and coldly calculating. I guess some people might think, well, it's not just that Howard's emotional, he's actually quite unable to pull himself together and just keep doing his job, but this is overtly false. He pulls himself together quite well in this scene. Grief is a part of life, and Howard is clearly facing and embracing it while Jimmy is hiding from its shadow. Even if Howard did struggle to pull himself together, the logical assumption would be that this relates to him as he is at that time rather than the institution of therapy. I'm really not trying to defend therapy, I'm trying to make the point that Jimmy doesn't make some practical decision that therapy doesn't work. Instead, he decides that therapy is for people like Howard, and he's not like Howard. He's a tough guy. And if he's going to feel feelings, it's going to be for some extenuating reason. For instance, we can talk about Jimmy manipulating Chuck's liability insurance by exploiting his own emotional pain. It's the only family I got left, and he hates me. He hates my guts. All the while, he's mainly feeding the company information about Chuck's condition to raise his insurance premiums. In the season 6 finale scene, he says he got Chuck's insurance cancelled, but I don't think that's technically true, though it's fair to put it strongly since they raised the rates so much it forced Chuck out of his job. And while I know there might be a couple people who think Jimmy was justified since Chuck was having actual medical problems, the ethical move would have been to actually talk to Chuck, then when that failed to talk to his employer or the state licensing board, the bar. Going to Chuck's insurance is a completely backhanded thing that doesn't really help anyone. It just makes him a huge burden to his employer after over a year of medical leave. I'm not saying it's some tragedy that HHM had to pay higher premiums. It could well be the right thing for them to have to do, but that doesn't change the fact that Jimmy wasn't doing this to hold his brother accountable in any kind of genuinely helpful way. It was to hurt him. If we need any evidence, of this, look at how he reports Chuck for things Jimmy himself caused. He's making mistakes with his clients. He's mixing up numbers on important documents. Would he have done this if he knew that it would have caused pressure on Chuck to be forced out? It doesn't seem like a very hard prediction to make. There's honestly no endgame I can see besides this putting pressure on Chuck to leave the company. We see this a lot with Jimmy's behavior where there's a consequence he could have predicted, which is Chuck being forced out, and then there's a further consequence which he really could not have predicted, which is Chuck ending his own life. And that's the tragedy, and that's why we feel so conflicted towards Jimmy is because some of it he really is responsible for and some of it he isn't, and that's just so sad and fun to watch. Maybe Jimmy should have listened to his own advice, though. Can I ask you something? What what were you hoping would happen? I mean... Good question, Jimmy. If we want to understand where his mind was at in making that decision, we can consider what we see Jimmy do right before this, presumably the night before. We see him out with Kim, and at one point after a long pause, Kim admits that she feels guilty about how they sabotaged Chuck at the chicanery hearing. Jimmy takes, let's say, not very much responsibility. Everything that happened was his own fault. Everything. 
Kim gets clearly uncomfortable and takes a long pause to process things while Jimmy sips his drink with frustration. Soon, Kim, wanting to cheer up Jimmy and also wanting fun and games as ever, goes back to fantasizing about scams, and we see Jimmy's attempt to play along, clearly feeling repressed guilt. As the episode runs, we go from this to Mike and Nacho having a nice little chat with our best friend Price lurking in the background like the realist gangster, and then we immediately see Jimmy at the liability insurance company. So it's this state of guilt out with Kim that we see precede him hurting his brother enormously. I think Jimmy's basically like, oh no, I'm not going to feel guilty, ashamed, or sad. I'm going to use this guilt, shame, and sadness. I'm going to exploit it. I'm going to loan it out and charge interest. I'm a wolf. I spent years caring for him and now he hates me. As the viewer, it's clear that he's fully acting. But if he let himself feel feelings, he'd probably end up saying the exact same thing just in a truthful way instead of a phony one. The overlap of his sincerity and insincerity is a feature we saw brought out over and over towards the end, like when he opened up to Frank the security guard talking about all real stuff but strictly for the purpose of manipulation. My brother is dead. What I'm searching for in this video are times he was able to break through that impulse and instead prioritize himself in a real way instead of using his feelings for manipulation. For example, consider Jimmy saying I love you finally to Kim, but only when it's useful, when she's breaking up with him and he thinks this Hail Mary might change her mind. Hey, I love you. She says it back, but in a way that has a completely different subtext. I love you too. She's not trying to get anything from him when she says it. She's just communicating that their love for each other isn't enough to justify staying together in the face of the consequences of their love. In a sense, this exchange is the same pattern we saw of one repeating the other, but Kim is fully comfortable having her meaning be different and distinct and having that be understood. Which takes us right back to that season 3 scene we were talking about where Jimmy is out with Kim. Before Kim mentions feeling guilty about what they did to Chuck, they're fantasizing about scamming the jerks at the fancy bar. But then Jimmy inevitably takes it way too seriously and way too far. We're not actually doing this, right? We're just talking. Yeah. Just talking. Again, this is one suggesting something and the other repeating it, but here instead of the meaning being changed like with the I love yous, it's more that Jimmy just simply doesn't mean what he said. He accepts her suggestion, but the fact that she even needed to make it was probably bad enough. Still, I think to Kim, his obsessiveness about scamming is scary, but also kind of fascinating. So we've talked about Jimmy's pattern of struggling to take accountability, to genuinely apologize, and to unselfishly confess, and we've talked about how he manipulates his emotions to serve himself, instead of just feeling them and reflecting on their causes. But I don't think we've answered whether the show's conclusion is him returning to an earlier state of higher moral sensibility or finding it for the first time. I think the answer is just a bit more complicated. Like, he doesn't get worse over the course of Better Call Saul exactly, he just has good and bad in him the whole time, and it gets expressed in all different kinds of combinations. He's occasionally done bad things for probably most of his life, but it wasn't always dominating his life, and it wasn't always getting people killed. He's regularly appeared to take accountability for the bad things he's done, but it was often to achieve something he wanted or because he really couldn't stop himself from expressing feelings about the things he's done or been involved in. But it does seem that in the grand finale, he finally reaches a breaking point in his ability to overlook the horrible consequences of his actions, and it's a big change because as we've looked at in depth now, it's really not easy to find examples of Jimmy unselfishly taking responsibility. I tell titled my first Better Call Saul video, Can People Change? But of course, I'm a therapist, I obviously believe people can change. That was never actually up in the air in the general sense. But in the specific sense, it is always a perplexing question. Can this specific person change this specific behavior pattern? As I talked about with Simply Snaps in our post-mortem stream, which by the way is on the side channel, go check that out, I think the question, can people change, sort of depends on what you mean by can. 
plan? Like what factors are we sort of saying are at play and what are we supposing would have to be different for the change to happen? It can be the hardest thing in the world to intentionally change a habit or a pattern, but if it's going to happen, the person has to obviously want to change and they also have to be able to imagine a life where that change is possible, which is why we see Jimmy's self-destruction reach a peak when he's living a futureless life as Gene. Though that feeling of futurelessness is most pronounced when he's living in hiding as Gene, it's a feeling he's had with him much of his life. Thing you folks need to know about me? I got nothing to lose. And yes, he's saying this here as a negotiation tactic with the Kettlemans, but I also think that, uh, like a lot of people, Jimmy did regularly struggle to envision a future for himself that would be fulfilling. As a therapist, I'm biased, but I really think that a ton of people are walking around at any given moment thinking, what the heck is the point of all this crap? We just don't talk about it too regularly because we're eating, sleeping, and working. Like many people, Jimmy has always craved individuality, a sense of efficacy, a sense of heroism, to feel important, to feel cool, to be seen as a legitimate guy worthy of respect, as a lawyer and a person. All of us have self-esteem that rests on our ability to fulfill certain visions of ourselves. but for so much of the show, Jimmy's vision of himself is as a wolf, and acting on that image is not a recipe for him actually being happy in a sustainable way. This is especially clear after Kim leaves him and we see a long montage of his fast living Saul lifestyle that culminates in him sitting at his ostentatious desk with an empty expression. Something's missing in his life here, something in himself. And we can go back to seasons one through three and blame Chuck for not supporting him, sure, but Chuck was functionally incapable of supporting him while there was a constant risk of Jimmy acting out and getting into trouble. Just as Jimmy was functionally incapable capable of stopping himself. Or was he? What I think is Chuck can say, I know what you were. What you are. And Howard can say, You were born that way. But excuse me if I don't assume they are both necessarily 100% correct. I don't think these are simple statements of fact. Howard said this to Jimmy after the worst professional experience of his entire life that Jimmy and Kim caused, and Chuck said that to Jimmy when cornered by Jimmy's knowledge that Chuck prevented him from getting hired at HHM. I think in both cases it makes no sense to judge these characters as having perfect insight into Jimmy's natural predispositions and genetic makeup. Of course, Walter in the finale echoes this exact sentiment, but in these first two instances, Chuck and Howard are both expressing their feeling that after everything they've been through with Jimmy, it's not possible for them to even think of him as someone who can change. Not because they're necessarily right, but because emotionally that would be way too difficult. They need to view him as fundamentally bad because it's the only explanation that they can live with and make sense of. I I understand Howard's point of view a bit more than Chuck's, since even though Chuck has known Jimmy longer, he could have reasonably been expected to try harder to be positive and supportive to Jimmy, of course. The way Walter views Saul as always having been bad might make some people think that this must be true, but what I take away is that there's a bit of truth and a bit of overgeneralization in this way of understanding someone. The fact that Jimmy used to do slip and fall scams, which he reveals to Walter, tells us a lot about who he is, but not nearly as much as the fact that he barely seems able to feel any genuine regret about it when he talks about it now. That fact tells us infinitely more, and so my point is that if he didn't change as a person, it's not because he did bad things in the past, it's because he hadn't yet allowed himself to feel anything approaching the full weight of his actions, their causes, and their effects. And I was stupid and young, and I was trying to show off, so I hit the ice fast as I could. I biffed it so hard I heard a crack. It can't be missed that Jimmy's regret is explicitly focused on how he hurt himself, not anyone else. My knee's never been the same. He actually doesn't mention harm to anyone else or what he did being wrong on principle. So in my opinion, that's why what Walter says feels right. Not because Jimmy used to do bad stuff, but because he hasn't really even reflected on it yet. It's interesting that the series shows us this scene in the final episode that fills in a moral gap in the main character's development as we see him in the Saul stage between Jimmy and Gene, and he's not ignorant of his past actions, but not yet really aware of them either. And the scene between Chuck and Jimmy that we were just talking about is a good example 
example of an inflection point in Jimmy's life. When we're watching this, we're not really thinking about the Saul Goodman that will come or all the dark stuff that'll happen. We're just feeling firsthand how things could have gone differently. They don't, and I don't wish they did, but if Chuck had been more mature when Jimmy pressed him on why he prevented Jimmy from joining HHM, he could have taken accountability and that probably would have helped Jimmy a lot. Instead, he blames Jimmy and says, you're not a real lawyer. Chuck stubbornly thinks that him acting against his brother is for some greater good. His so-called rational justification that Jimmy is not qualified to be a lawyer is based predominantly in emotions like resentment. Preventing your sibling from professional opportunities is so bad on principle that you have to have a ridiculously solid reason to justify ever doing it, like knowledge of immediate harm that would be caused, and Chuck never had that. Assumptions based on past experience are not inherently always justifications for current action. The ethical thing would have been for him to be honest to his brother that he had resentment about the different paths they took to becoming a lawyer, and after talking about that, maybe he'd not overtly vouch for his brother at HHM but not get in the way. Chuck is allowed to act on his feelings of resentment, but the question is what way of acting on the feelings makes the world a better place for either of them? Taking his feelings out on his brother only hurt them both, every single time. Instead of taking ownership of his resentment, Chuck acted out here completely self-righteously and deeply wounded his brother for no reason. To give credit to Jimmy, he was angry but he was justifiably angry and even with his anger he was speaking sensibly. Why were you working against me, Chuck? It's really interesting to see such vulnerability in the man who would later insist he didn't care about his brother passing away. But of course, years after that, we'd see Jimmy in the grand finale admit his wrongdoing towards Chuck under oath, which I think came from his guilty awareness of this same principle, that he was supposed to look out for Chuck. His vulnerability, of course, doesn't get rewarded by the court, but it does get rewarded by Kim, who visits him in prison and shows him affection again. Back with Chuck, his vulnerability was punished in a certain sense just as much as as it was by the court, since Chuck essentially handed down a life sentence to his brother. I know what you were, what you are. People don't change. You're slipping Jimmy. Obviously, it's very significant that Chuck says what rather than who. It's dehumanizing language that to me shows that it's painful for Chuck to think of Jimmy as a changeable person because then he feels the tragedy of why won't he change. But we don't have access to an alternate reality where Chuck was always super supportive to his brother, so we don't know whether it really would have made a big difference in Jimmy's destiny. I asked my delightful subscribers right before the grand finale whether Jimmy was still alive and well in the personas of Saul and Gene, or whether he was fundamentally a different person, and the vast majority of people said that he's the same guy still. This makes sense given that most of us have a pretty coherent understanding of how selves work. It's still worth noting that seven or eight hundred different people view Jimmy, Saul, and Gene as fundamentally different people, which is interesting because it shows that either these people view him as changing more, or that they see a lower amount of change being required to say a person's different. I imagine the percent of people saying he was a different person would have been lower if I asked right after the finale rather than right before. The truth is, the changes in the creature we call Jimmy don't have to do much with his name. It's really Really just about the person. I sort of love the gene who yells get a lawyer to the kid getting arrested, but I couldn't care less about the gene robbing the cancer victim's house after drugging the man unconscious. Or should I call him Victor with a K here? Victor St. Clair? What a name. The show is able to make me care about him to the extent that when he's doing basically anything but scamming cancer patients, I want to see him win. And even in those times that I don't want to see him win and I want to see him face consequences, really it's just because that same small part of me won't shut up about maybe there being a chance he could grow if he's incentivized to. Victor St. Clair and Saul Goodman are the identities that he chooses to assume. Gene is an identity he's basically forced into, and Jimmy, of course, he didn't have much choice about. Slippin' Jimmy he had a choice about. That was an identity born of his behavior, his passion for the most fundamentally basic swindle of all time, the slip and fall. A slip and fall. 
Yeah, Walter, it's called the slip and fall. Gosh. It's a theme all throughout the series, and more observant people than me have pointed out the way the mall shots of the floor cleaning machine riding guy are foreshadowing of the all-important slip and fall that comes in the final episodes, and of course I'm talking about Jeff's slip. Jeff's slip wasn't fake, though. It was a real sort of boy-who-cried-wolf payoff for Jimmy slash Gene when his accomplice Jeff slips and falls at the height of their robbery plan. Let's talk more about that robbery plan with Jeff, because I think it's pretty fascinating that Gene was at that point willing to risk everything, even by just getting in touch with Jeff at all after their run-in at the mall. Who's to say that Jeff was going to be so easily convinced? Could he not have outed Gene as Saul if a few small things had been different? Saul is slipping at this point, which I think is evidenced also by the fact that at the end of the Nippy episode, he tells Marion that his fake pet Nippy was found. You're not gonna believe this, but uh, he was with a family the whole time, just, just a few blocks away. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's a very small point, and you may think it's meaningless, but to me it immediately seemed like, well, hey, wouldn't it have been slightly safer to tell her Nippy wasn't found? I mean, I guess he had just gone out of his way to sever ties with Jeff, so maybe he thought he was never going to see Marion again, but I think it's significant that he's compelled to give her an explicitly happy conclusion to the story. So, after all that, a happy ending. As this is right towards the end of the episode, and we all knew that we were coming up on the end of this amazing series, this line totally blew everybody's minds, and I saw tons of people repeating it online right after the episode aired. It's just too perfect that he feels the need to give a happy ending, and I think it reflects the struggle the show's creators wrestled with in figuring out how happy the ending should be. Here's a screenshot of me trying to predict what would happen a few days before the final episode. I wasn't very right, but I did say it could be that he actually faces consequences, either gets arrested or dies. But I thought that was unlikely. Still, I guessed that maybe he will get arrested and they'll book him as Jimmy McGill and it'll be a nice conclusion, lol. The name's McGill. I'm James McGill. Though he clearly went back to being called Saul in prison, because that's how everybody already knew him. Let's call Saul. But now he's going by Saul because there's a community of people who seem to respect him as Saul. He's not going by Saul to separate from himself. But to return to Gene's decision to work with Jeff, this goes back to the futurelessness idea, as Gene obviously is not happy with his life, and that's why he's willing to risk it all to plan a heist of many thousands of dollars of merchandise, risking his freedom and his job and his privacy and everything. And why? To shut up Jeff? He tracks down Jeff because he couldn't handle the uncertainty of not knowing whether this random taxi driver would tell on him, and to be fair, he was in a really tight spot. He was forced into a corner, and I have gotten a lot of comments on the second video in this series from people who were entertained about me being wrong in my prediction that we'd see season 6 start with him killing Jeff. I was wrong, obviously, about the way the show had us wait until the 10th episode, of the season for the gene factor, but I was also wrong about how he would address the situation, of course. Not that his method was much less destructive. Besides killing Jeff, having blackmail in the form of knowledge of Jeff's criminal activity seems to be the only other possibility, I guess, and I didn't think of it back then because frankly, I'm not as hardcore as Gene. Gene's only other options were to flee somewhere else and start over again, or just keep living his life and hope the random taxi driver guy doesn't keep coming back to the mall. Not hard to see these as ethically superior, of course, to spending two or three weeks developing relationships with Jeff, Buddy, and Marion, as well as Frank and Nick and security in order to pull off an incredible scam. And he does all that to silence Jeff, so what? So he could continue to live in peace as Gene? I find that hard to believe. He doesn't seem to care much at all for his life as Gene. This is why the way I see it is that Gene goes after Jeff with this scam not just to get his leverage, but also for cold, hard revenge, which makes sense since a theme of this show is questioning the ethics of revenge. If you rewatch that season 5 Jeff and Gene scene, you notice, well, first of all, something seems strangely different about Jeff's appearance. No one knows why this is, but he does appear slightly different before season 6, one could say. But more importantly, 
Suddenly, the whole dynamic of this interaction is completely switched, with Jeff having all the power towering over Gene as he's planted like a sitting duck. His identity has been outed, and he's being told what to do. I, I don't know what you're... Sure you do. Just say it. Jeff presses him, but really Gene gives astoundingly little pressure back. Jeff just insists a few times, and Gene is all ready to say the thing. Better call Saul. There we go. I rewatched this scene to see just how much it seemed like Jeff was threatening to reveal his secret, and by the looks of it, it does seem quite risky. I'll see you. Gene. Plus, Jeff and Buddy were there not to shop at the mall, but to specifically find Gene, I think. This was, of course, not the first time Gene met Jeff, since the previous season opened with Gene getting picked up by Jeff as his ride home from the hospital after fainting. It's wild that we literally hear Jeff say nothing in this first scene of him. I've had some creepy taxi drivers, but wow. I was wondering, in their next scene together at the mall, does Gene remember Jeff's eyes when he sees him in full in the light of day? It seems like he would, since he was just getting back to work at Cinnabon after only a few days of hiding out after the spooky taxi experience. But honestly, I don't really catch the sense of him noticing that it's the same guy. But Jeff mentions that he's a cab driver, so Gene absolutely puts it together by that point. Nonetheless, he's faced with a decision to change identities again or not. And he decides, I'm gonna fix it myself. This decision directly led to his imprisonment, but of course he didn't want the safe option. He wanted to prove to himself that he could make this taxi driver shut up, and he could do it on his own. It came from a desire to assert himself, and also a desire for revenge for the way Jeff got power over him. Jeff made him feel small, he dominated him, and it seems to be just the next day that Gene goes and pays a visit to Marion and Jeff. We see a pretty ugly side of him in this whole escapade. He's chosen to get power over Jeff. Jeff, and Jeff is so scared that his entire appearance is somehow different. But in all seriousness, Gene completely turns the tables on Jeff by showing up at his house, raising the stakes, and saying, you know who I am, I know who you are. Jeff is treated to the carrot and stick, the stick being the threat of I know where you live, and the carrot being the possibility of profitable swindling. Gene gains leverage also by manipulating the feelings of Marion, simulating friendship to gain access to little Jeffy. He gets Jeff and Buddy into this bizarrely complex three-minute mall theft scam that takes takes weeks to orchestrate, and at the end of it, Gene clearly does not need to assert the dominance that he feels compelled to assert. Man, you don't have to threaten us. We're all friends here. I am not your friend. In their season 5 mall scene that took place about three weeks earlier, Jeff was of course making Gene say better call Saul, and in this scene, Gene is making Jeff say something now. We're done. Say it. After a 10 second pause and a glance Jeff exchanges with Buddy, he concedes in a sort of bothered or hurt tone. We're done. Jeff's the dominated guy now, and we get one of my favorite shots of the final episodes as Gene makes Buddy say it too. If we look for earlier examples of this aggressive intensity, it isn't hard to find them. Like back in the season three scene when Kim expresses feeling guilt about their chicanery against Chuck. Was there another way? This is how Jimmy responds to that. You put him in the rearview mirror. He is not worth thinking about. Done. We can see this line is a little less intense than with Jeffy, but both instances also saw him putting emphasis on the word done. It's like it's a mantra. Done. 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 But we are not done, because this is my first post Better Call Saul video, and I have more to say, surprisingly. I want to talk about what happens next, because this downward spiral happens so abruptly in the last four episodes that we need to pick it apart to see the facets of Jimmy's alleged redemption. The legendary Nippy episode that we've been talking about ends with Gene wandering back to the scene of the crime. He revels in the feeling, and he uses fashion and style to remind himself of his glory days as Saul. He folds 
holds the tie over the flashy jacket as if to say, this is my outfit, whether I wear it or not. Side note, Saul would have loved Dan Flashes if those stores were around then. But he leaves the suit there and he seems to shake his head of the delusion that he could ever recapture that feeling. We see him next on the phone with Francesca. He leaves her a money drop or she wouldn't talk to him. She updates him about the state of things. Feds found it all, Saul. Also, she explains that she turned in his offshore bank account with $850,000. Once he adjusts to this reality and all the information is transferred, he wants to keep talking. There's nothing else. Well, that's not true. After all this time, well, come on, just fill me in. He asks about a few people and she updates him, ending with mentioning that Kim checked in on her back when shit hit the fan. What did you tell her? Nothing. But she asked. Yep. Yup, indeed. Yep. At this point, Gene is now fully ready to hang up because he's gotten something meaningful to him and he tries to be all nicey-nicey about it, which is unwanted. Uh, I guess this is goodbye. Uh, hello? Hello? He drives away and we see a glorious single shot of him processing information. Then he soon goes back to the phone booth to do something an ex shouldn't do, call out of the blue to Kim's work. We don't hear the call until the next episode. It's notable that when he calls Kim at her job to talk for the first time in six years, he calls under the name Victor with a K. Of course he does this so Kim will know it's him, but also Victor is a pure wolf identity. At this point, not even Victor Victor is the same as we used to know him to be. And it's not just the fact that he's calling her at work. Every detail of this conversation shows him continuing what he had just been doing with Francesca, which is trying to feel his old life again, but this time in a much more intense way, of course, because of the intimacy of his past relationship with Kim. Kim is largely not replying, and it's fascinating to see him talk himself into a hole, or more like talk himself into an a-hole. Subscribe for more amazing comedy. Anyway, he starts by performing this false cordial pretense. You know, just thinking it's been a while and uh, might be nice to catch up. Catch up? She's not excited by the idea and we can wonder why exactly Jimmy slash Jean slash Saul slash Victor with a K is even calling since it doesn't seem like catching up is really what he's up to. And since he very quickly goes elsewhere with the call. First he mentions it's been six years and she gives no reaction. She might still be haunted by what they did and might feel like it was just yesterday. But this is when we see him switch modes. He heads into emotional manipulation mode starting with self-pity. I thought you might want to know I'm still alive. He then moves swiftly into bragging. I'm still out here, still getting away with it. Feds couldn't find their own ass with both hands in a proctologist. He goes into way too much incriminating detail, putting Kim in an even more uncomfortable position, if that's even possible, and we see the wolfishness of his aggressive and belligerent way of speaking to her. You shouldn't be calling me. Oh, hey. Awake. He doesn't feel the care from her that he unjustifiably expects, so he reacts by taunting her to get a reaction. Come on, Kim, say something. <laughs> you can call me an asshole. Yell at me. Just let me know you still got a pulse. Like most of his behavior, this is an instance where he causes something to happen that he doesn't expect, and Kim reacts like this. You should turn yourself in. He scoffs at the idea of accountability and clearly reacts much more than Kim expects. We see her kind of furrow her brow in confusion, like, what did you think I was going to say when you just bragged about more illegal stuff you've done in the six years since we were both complicit in a murder? It's really not clear to me what he expected here, but we see him be very defensive. Spill your guts, put on your hair shirt, see what it gets you. Why are Kim, why are we even talking about this? The way he so smoothly transitions from yelling to tender seems manipulative, and we can see that he comes very close to getting her to break. I only wanted to... Kim. He says her name twice more, and she goes like this. Kim. I'm glad you're alive. 
That's all she's willing to give him and it makes a lot of sense, also because that was one of the first things he said on the call, and one of the only remotely acceptable things he said. Even though he mentioned still being alive in a self-pitying way, it was way better than the aggressive bragging and insulting that came after and shocked Kim. We see the same attitude from him years earlier when, as Saul, he acts rude and mean when they're signing their divorce papers. It shouldn't be surprising that Jean and Saul share some some characteristics as we see Gene etching SG was here in the wall in just our second view of him early on in the series. But the Saul and Kim divorce signing scene is amazing even before it starts. We've got a lobby full of people out here and at 8 o'clock I am done. I don't care if the building burns down, I'm going home. Wow. Saul is unnecessarily cruel when he gets called out for nervously bouncing a ball in his office. That's the sound of thinking. You should try it sometime. I love the silly sound it makes when he fixes the column that falls down. He puts on a fancy jacket before inviting Kim in. We don't see this scene until 40 minutes later after seeing Kim's life as a brunette, their phone call, her turning herself into Cheryl in the court, and Jean robbing a man with cancer who he drugged with barbiturates. After seeing all that stuff six or so years in the future, we return to Kim and Saul's office and it opens with over a minute of no dialogue as Kim signs, then Francesca enters, and then Saul signs. The first time we see them talk is when Saul asks Kim what she thinks of his absurd parody of an office, and she says something very vague. Pretty great, right? Yeah, it's, um, yep. Another yup. Yep. It makes sense that she wouldn't expound on her opinion here. It's a situation where most people would be polite and reticent, but what immediately struck me was how Saul didn't even seem to realize, or didn't care? I guess that's possible, but to me it genuinely seemed like he didn't pick up on the fact that she might have some critiques of the way he fashions himself nowadays. Of course she knows he's an artist. For instance, she was there back when he was putting so much care and attention into the wallpaper at the office they used to have. It's Etude in blue over Daydream Harvest. I wanted it to look like morning over the Sandias. Because I struggled to change, I'm planning on making a couple more videos about Better Call Saul, by the way, and the next one is currently slated to be about Jimmy the Artist, as I mentioned in the last video and didn't get around to this time because there's so much more going on. Saul's a good talker, but one art he doesn't know is the art of listening, and back to this divorce scene with Kim, let's just say he's not the best listener. He asks her why she moved to Florida, and this happens. Florida. Florida, Florida, Florida. Why there? I guess it doesn't matter. After interrupting her, he tells her, Hey, I gotta tell you, I think you're gonna regret not taking your share of the sandpiper money. What an interesting mention of regret. The 10 seconds of uncomfortable silence they share is when the switch flips. Kim decides to withdraw, and this leads to Jimmy deciding to act out. Mm -hmm. Have a nice life, Kim. She glares through him, and we see Saul perform like he's doing desk work, which immediately reminded me of his last interaction with Chuck, when Chuck acted as if he was sitting down to do desk work after breaking his brother's spirit. To Kim, he says, have a good life, because he so does not have a problem with them never talking again. What do you think, he has feelings? Kim thinks for a few seconds, and then very strongly decides to leave, as her body language shows. It's interesting to compare this scene to the scene we talked about at length in part 3. Actually at such length that this was the clip that got the video demonetized. Sorry about those ads by the way, YouTube put them there. This is the scene where Jimmy reads his late brother's last letter. Then, Kim was overwhelmed with emotion and Jimmy let himself feel nothing at all. In this situation in his office years later, he's still the hugely repressed one. All the energy of this second to last episode and all its demonstration of how much his character has morally degraded, it all culminates in him threatening violence on Marion after Jeff gets arrested and Marion's revealed to know about Jean's life as Saul. Marion, being a person of ethics, holds him accountable with her magic button. There's a criminal standing in my kitchen threatening me. He's a wanted man and his name is Saul Goodman. This of course sends him on the run and sends us into the grand finale. We began today's video by acknowledging, hey, isn't it pretty cool that he admitted the bad stuff he did and took responsibility? And after 
are a lot of examples. I think we established that this is very likely the first significant instance of him taking accountability and feeling regret in a truly unselfish way. We looked at his typical patterns of emotional manipulation and the way he turns his feelings into a means to an end. And we talked about the spiral of harm that he became in his last weeks of freedom. Actually, when he's living as Gene, he is in a sense not really free. Instead, he's fixed in the muck of the consequences of his past actions, dissociating into the Cinnabon machine while he dreams of what it was like to ever feel something. This shot comes after he buys the same kind of foot relaxing machine he had in his Saul office, uh, which inspires a three minute montage of him directing Jeff and Buddy in a complex plan to drug men, break into their homes, and steal their identities. And then the show cuts from the scam to the Cinnabon job as if to contrast the excitement and value of these various forms of labor. Then we see a switch flip which is so nice after the great switch flip when Jimmy first started at Davis and Maine. But actually, we don't have to go back that far at all because we saw a prominent Cinnabon machine switch flip earlier in this same episode of season six after the frustrating call with Kim from the phone booth. He flipped the machine on. And then after the scamming montage, he flipped it off. To me, the flipping switch seems to symbolize something that can't be undone or something changing in an abrupt way. Obviously, switches can be flipped back, but when I think of a switch, I think of the difference between a switch and a knob, meaning a switch isn't attuned to a spectrum. It's just got two sides. It's binary. And when you go from one to the other, you change things somehow in a way that's not good or bad, but just different. I found a Reddit thread from four years ago where someone asked where this switch flip motif was ever used again, which was exactly what I was wondering, and no one seemed to have any examples. So I helpfully added some updated info. When Gene flips the Cinnabon machine switch here, it almost seems like the whole three minute scamming montage that led up to it was a daydream he was imagining, but it really happened and it was what was stimulating his mind during the day at his presumably uninteresting job. The switch symbolizes that the actions he's taking and now fantasizing about are crossing a line and he has pushed a boulder that is now rolling down the hill beyond his control. So, he behaved aggressively towards Jeff, Buddy, and Kim in his final weeks of so-called freedom, and he drugged people and stole their identities. I didn't hear him take accountability for that in his sworn testimony, but it may have added to his sentence, I guess? I mean, not really, because I'm sure the police didn't find out about the extent of the scam, but okay, whatever. When the show ends, Kim has seemed to forgive him for everything but getting himself locked up up for 86 years, but should we? Is forgiving him the same as saying he's redeemed himself, or is redemption a lower bar than forgiveness? Or a higher bar? I think the most true way to describe the major change in Jimmy is that he becomes capable of genuine regret. Regret that seems consistent, and not just a fleeting means to a materialistic, self-interested end. We can contrast this regret with the quote-unquote regret he showed back in his season 3 pre-prosecution meeting with Chuck about destroying the tape recorder that had his confession. I regret it all, all of it, more than you can imagine. It doesn't take a mind reader to know that he's not genuine here. The district attorney is the one who made him apologize when he thought the meeting was over. Uh, now? Yes, Mr. McGill, now. At this point in his life, he still felt more like the victim, and I guess he hadn't yet committed enough harm for him to genuinely notice and reflect on. He's so lovable, though, that it's tempting to give him credit for the bare minimum. So, is it redemption because he can feel genuine regret now? In seeing this change in Jimmy, we have to acknowledge that he wouldn't have taken responsibility like he did in the grand finale without Kim having done so first, accepting his challenge of taking accountability and turning turning herself in. She raised the bar for him like she used to. She showed up to the courtroom thinking she was going to watch him lower the bar right back down, but that was just his romantic gesture to get her there. Oh, um, I lied to the government about uh, Kim Wexler. A cool move, but it's still manipulative on some level, and Kim is alert, but not impressed at this point. This starts to shift as Jimmy admits his crimes with Walter White, but when he finishes, he clearly expects her to be much more impressed than she is, and we see him very scared. Is he throwing it all away for nothing? 
This is what causes him to go on to say more on the record, and he tears up about Howard, gives Kim credit for leaving town, and admits his final sabotage of Chuck. Finally, it seems like she has some respect for him. I'm not a mind reader though, and for example, a shot like this one could be anything from her feeling the power of Jimmy's confessions about Chuck, or her reacting to seeing Jimmy as being insincere. Because it needs to be remembered, y'all, Jimmy can fake tears. He did it at the insurance company and he could do it again. I'm not saying he was faking, but I think there's no way to prove how genuine his performance here is. You could say that it must have been genuine because he was incriminating himself, but I think that doesn't add up when you take into account that he was serving his deeper need of being liked and respected by at least one person on the planet, Kim. In my opinion, his regret was real, and it doesn't make a difference that his accountability served his own needs too, because this is how it always or usually is with accountability anyway. We're going to be also serving our own long-term health and relationship needs when we take accountability for our actions. That's just sort of inherent in what accountability is and how it functions to build trust and social dynamics. At the end of his full on-the-record confession, Kim isn't exactly swooning over him, of course, but she seems to be at peace with who he is, able to see him again. It's not exactly a relaxing moment for Jimmy. He lowers his eyes, but it's significant that the exact moment he raises his eyes to look at her again, he musters up a half smile just for her. At some point in the future, she clandestinely visits him in prison and sneaks him a cig, but also expresses that she's upset he's locked away for life. Just listen to her voice here. 86 years. We see their dynamic is as sharp as ever, as Jimmy says, But with good behavior, who knows? He makes her smile. She's amused by his optimism. And this is the last line of the scene and of the whole show. With good behavior, who knows? Wow. It's the last line because finger guns don't count as a line, of course. Jimmy shoots her the finger guns as she leaves, and she does give them back, though hers are aiming down, very subtle. She couldn't be doing that out in the open as she poses as his lawyer, especially because I bet she's planning to come back and visit again. I've seen some people say that they didn't think Kim returned the finger guns, and the Wikipedia page on this grand finale episode says in a very unbiased way he goes to the prison yard to see her off and shoots her finger guns, Kim acknowledges the gesture and leaves. The question is, does she do more than just acknowledge? Does she reciprocate? To me, her hand shape is unmistakable, and she seems to be smiling a little, so I say yes to the finger guns. And I think based on where he's standing, he saw the finger guns. Still, he's not super happy with where he's ended up. Before we finish up, I'll mention that I don't think locking him up for life is the ideal form of justice. However, it's clear that the man was an immense harm to those around him, and in absolutely no way was he seeming to improve himself or reduce the pain he was causing. But the real justice would be to create a world where people are less incentivized to harm other people in order to benefit themselves. In that scene with Walter, Jimmy tells us that he started doing the slip and falls to put himself through bartending school. So maybe if we really want to create a better world, we need to make bartending school tuition free. Yep, that was the call to action, and I think it would be really meaningful if we all gave a lot of thought to that and really pondered how to create a better world. So I just want to say thank you for watching the video all the way to the end, and if you want to support these videos with money, you can become a member on YouTube for like three US dollars, or you can support the channel via Patreon for one dollar, two dollars, ten dollars, uh, forty-five thousand dollars, basically probably whatever, I don't know if it goes up that high, but you can support the channel. I obviously put hundreds of hours of work into even just this video let alone the other ones. And um, I really enjoy it and I'm gonna keep doing it forever, but if you want to support the videos, you can uh, incentivize me to keep putting as much time and effort into these videos as I already do. So in addition to that, on the Patreon, you get a backlog of videos and music going back like two years, two and a half years. The YouTube members get anything new that comes out, any behind the scenes stuff. Like for this video, 
I'm uploading a how-to video on making the background sort of like screen savory thing uh, that I put in all these videos. I actually made a demonstration, like screen recorded myself making it and I'm gonna do narration so you can hear it all and you can be like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, interesting or whatever. I put extra content out, I put early release content out, so I just want you to know if you do want to support the channel, there's a bunch of extra stuff you can get, and you can also be part of the Discord community if you'd like, and that's pretty cool. We do some Discord-only conversations, chats, we have fun, we talk about Better Call Saul, we talk about other stuff. It's really a great time, we've had some, like, basically streams and podcasts that are just like Discord calls and we're gonna do more of that. So fun stuff, come join the community or just like and subscribe and share the YouTube video, you know, with your friends, your enemies, uh, you know, people who are, you're relatively neutral towards. So there's a lot of good ways to support this channel. If you like these videos, I really appreciate it. Leave a comment, let me know what you think. I do read most of the comments, so I'll really enjoy hearing what you have to say. And, um, yeah, I, I know everybody has an interesting perspective. First up, thank you to the patrons on Patreon. Um, you're not any better than the YouTube members, but it's just different. So let's just, just, let's start with that. Uh, there's a big rivalry going on between the YouTube members and the Patreon patrons, so I really don't even want to get into it. It's, it's some pretty nasty stuff. But I'll start with the Patreon patrons this time. And uh, thank you so much to Anonymous User. I think I've been calling you an anonymous person, but your name is User in Patreon. So I'm sorry I haven't been calling you your name. Thank you, User. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Strawman Productions. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Magenta Lava Lamp. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Thulusaurus Rex. Thank you, Gunther. Thank you, Modest Maoist. Thank you, Boom. Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you, Halls Balls. Thanks so much, Doug. Thank you, Ariamon. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Elias. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Joe. This is a different Joe, I'm sorry. This is Joe M. The previous thank you was for Joe N. I hope that didn't get mixed up. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Flip-A-Coin. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, 76 Trombones. And thank you, Cat. Now I want to slide over to the YouTube members. And first up, thank you, Elias, which also, Elias is a Patreon patron and a YouTube member, so sort of bringing the two worlds together, and that's, that's really meaningful uh, peacemaking work. Thank you, Jaden. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Simply Snaps. So thank all of you. That is so many people. Oh my gosh, what an amazing problem to have that I have so many names to read. Thank you all for supporting the channel. It means so much. Another thing I want to mention before I finish is so I have the next few videos sort of lightly planned. Uh, you know, two, maybe three videos about Better Call Saul. I've talked about Jimmy as an artist being something I want to go into. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I want to dig into more about revenge and consequences and dig in more to some stuff with Mike and Nacho there. And then, of course, I want to make a video about Price because I think he's just like the most important character in the show. So I'm hoping that I can get those three videos out before the end of the year, but who knows. One other thing I wanted to cover before I get out of here is I had a lot of people ask what was it like to watch the last few episodes of Better Call Saul having not seen Breaking Bad. And if you're new to this channel, surprise, I haven't seen Breaking Bad. I will watch it, and I'm gonna make content about it for sure. But to answer the questions, I get that I missed certain things. Obviously, I didn't even know who Marie was when they introduced Marie. You know, I don't get the full weight of the stuff that's happening in some of those situations where they're referencing, you know, Breaking Bad. I don't understand the full weight of who Walter is, of who Jesse is, but I can tell you it's not hard to like fill in some of those gaps with just guesses and still overall enjoy the what's going on. I don't wanna make it sound like I'm getting everything. Obviously there are things that I might miss, 
But like, when Kim's interacting with Jesse, I, I get the gist of why this is meaningful, what he's asking her, you know, about who Saul is as a lawyer. And, you know, when, when it's Saul and Walter and they're talking to each other and Walter's like a jerk, but he sort of tells it like it is, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I don't know the full depth of his character, but I can sort of fill in some of the gaps and, and still feel like I'm appreciating it on a very deep level. The stuff with Marie, I don't know who she is. But I know who Hank is. I mean, he was on Better Call Saul, and I obviously have heard about Breaking Bad. So I get what's going on, even if I don't get all the necessary details to like understand the full weight of it. It's still not like confusing per se. You know, there's some things like, okay, wait, what's going on here for a bit? Like with Francesca or something like that. But like, it sort of fills itself in enough and I don't know I think the show's brilliant I think the show works on its own uh, but I still deeply enjoyed the last few episodes uh, I could not have been more satisfied with how the show came to an end and you can watch some of the live streams on the side channel that are preserved um, for like you know the last few episodes of the season I was doing live streams talking about my thoughts on the show and I was just so excited with each episode you know I was like nervous because I was like how good is it gonna be are they gonna fumble the bag like what's going on here but it was uh it was really really special and so yeah I mean I probably missed a few things but you know I I really feel like enjoying this show on its own has been such a special and uh fulfilling experience and I, I've really just been blown away by this artwork of a show Lastly, I'll say that uh, in addition to another few live streams I'm going to do on YouTube, I'll do them every now and then. I also stream more regularly on Twitch, so come check out the Twitch. And it's in the description, twitch.tv slash what's therapy. So I stream there more frequently. We got a little community there. We hang out. It's pretty fun. We react to stuff, critique, expound. You know, we have fun. So that's pretty much all I need to talk about now, and I'm uh, surprised if anyone's still watching, but if you are still watching, it means you're, you know, a pretty cool person, uh, technically. That's how it works out to uh, mean, scientifically. All right, so we did it. Six seasons of the show, six videos made about it so far. I'm pretty proud of uh, what we've been doing over here on this channel, and I just want to say thanks again for being a part of it. Now, go have a good rest of your day or night, and, you know, just remember, with good behavior, who knows? Oh shit, I'm being arrested. Hold on, I'm being arrested.